Thank you. My name is Melinda George, and I'm the president of the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you today to the release of the What Matters Now, a new compact for teaching and learning. We are so excited about this report and believe that it comes at a time when the country is ready to make the shifts that are needed to support great teaching and to ensure learning for every student that will prepare them for college, career, We are pleased to have so many friends and colleagues here today, so many of whom have contributed to the development of the report over the past 18 months. As we go through the program this morning, I also want to be sure that you know that this commission is actually really releasing two reports today. What Matters Now, a compact for teaching and learning call for action, which you all have in your hands, and those of you joining us by live stream can download from the NICTAF website. And also, What Matters Now, a compact for teaching and learning, the evidence base, which is an online report that provides a robust base of research examples and case studies that support the call to action. So I encourage you all to visit the NICTAF website and find that wealth of information as well. We invite you to use them both. We hope that there is something here for everyone. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you the NICTAF Commission. We are thrilled that so many of our commissioners could be here today, and we invite you to find them for any further input or questions that you might have. So I'm going to ask the commissioners just to stand as I call their name so that you know who they are and, and can find them when you need them. We have two co-chairs of our commission, uh, one of whom, Ted Sanders, could not be here today because of an injury. But we are so thrilled to have the co-chair of our commission, Secretary Richard Riley, here with us today. Michelle Cahill, Linda Darling-Hammond, Genevieve DeBose, Patrick Finn, Fred Frelo, Kaya Henderson, Dan Leeds, Monica Martinez, Del Meda, Ellen Moyer, Mark Music, and Rich Schwab. Thank you all so much for your incredible input to this commission investigation and report. And thank you for being here today. And for our commissioners who aren't able to be here today, we thank you for your input to the report um, and for your ongoing support. I also want to thank for our report and our report release some partners and sponsors who provided a lot of generosity in supporting NICTAF's work. We are very grateful to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Cisco Systems, the NEA Foundation, and our title sponsor, Total Wine and More, and the David Trone family. Thank you all so much for your support. <laughs> Finally, I want to extend a special thank you to my NICTAF colleague, Elizabeth Foster, for her leadership in the development of these reports. She <laughs> done an amazing job of writing, compiling input, editing, and revising, and the reports are so strong because of it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Where are you? There she is. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. It's my great honor to now introduce NICTAF co-chair, the Honorable Richard Riley. No introduction of Secretary Riley could adequately state what he has meant to education in this country. He has been the governor of South Carolina and the US Secretary of Education, and he's held many roles in between. But he has always put improving education for every student at the core of his work. 
He's one of the most dedicated, positive, and smart advocates I know, and I feel so fortunate every day to say that I have the honor of working with him. Secretary Riley, thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. What a nice introduction. And thank you all for, for being here uh, and joining us for this uh, 20th uh, anniversary of Nick Taft's landmark report, What Matters Most, and for today's release of our new report, What Matters Now. Before I begin, uh, I want to thank uh, Melinda George for her very productive uh, presidency of Nick Taft. It's been very uh, impressive and effective, and it's been a pleasure to work with you and Elizabeth Foster that you mentioned. Elizabeth is Nick Taft's vice president for strategic initiatives, and she's certainly a diligent uh, primary writer of what matters now. Uh, and Ryan Brooks, uh, Nick Taft's office manager, the three of them. Uh, you can see we have a very lean staff, but they have managed very effectively to put together this momentous report, as well as today's program and the events to introduce it. Now this has been an enormous undertaking. In addition to receiving considerable input uh, from uh, all of the Nick Taft commissioners who were introduced, uh, throughout the 18-month long process, Elizabeth and Melinda have interviewed and received uh, thoughts and ideas from more than 100 organizations and individuals all across the country. Many of you are part of that, and I thank you all for that. Uh, this is not our work uh, only at all. It, it involves putting together all of the ideas that everyone had, and I thank you for that. I'm a firm believer in collaboration, and that is collaboration. But I also want you to know how extremely difficult it is to bring all of the gathered uh, information together, synthesize it, condense it into a readable form, redraft it again, 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 and again. And let will tell you that's, not, that's an understatement. To finally then gain consensus, and I think we've done that, and I think we have a very good report in this final version. Now, for all of that, I congratulate and extend sincere thanks to the Nick Taft staff and all the commissioners, uh, and I want to mention also Ted Sanders, uh, who has had a back operation and, and was not able to be here. Uh, Ted, uh, as many of you know, was president of the uh, Commission of State. Uh, Education Commission of the States and a leader in the uh, Bush administration. Uh, we want to make it very clear that this is a bipartisan report. Uh, Ted, of course, Republican, I'm Democrat, but we are both uh, pro-education all the way. Uh, and what a pleasure it has been to work with uh, Ted. I see Tom Carroll is here. Tom Carroll is a longtime executive director of Nick Taft and was here at a very critical time and was a true leader in this effort. And Tom, it's great to have you with us here today. Now, since Nick Taft published uh, What Matters Most 20 years ago, uh, we've seen some significant progress. On the positive side, we've raised standards for teacher education. We've communicated the importance of clinical practice. Uh, induction and mentoring of new teachers is now recognized as a critical factor in improving teacher retention and favorably impacting student achievement. Uh, but the progress has been uneven, and I think all of us realize that, and it's really uh, been incomplete when you look at today's world. Uh, the changes uh, have not been systemic enough. We have not put in place the conditions uh, that allow all teachers to thrive and thereby help their students be ready for college, for careers, and for their life. Uh, our current education system, in all too many cases, uh, doesn't adequately respond to the rapid changes that have taken place over the last 20 years. Student population is much more diverse. Good jobs require more advanced education and deeper learning. The internet and other technologies have truly change teaching and learning dramatically. It's so clear then 
that skills such as critical thinking, communications, collaboration, creative problem solving, working on teams, these kind of skills clearly are absolutely essential uh, to be successful in today's changing world. Uh, as Bob Dylan wrote, and also Peter, Paul, and Mary sang, uh, <laughs> the times they are changing. And we know that, that's very true, and it's very accurate. These are exciting times indeed, uh, but the conditions in which teachers teach and students learn are changing, and they are complicated, and they must be addressed. And that's what this report is really all about. What matters now? What matters today? We know all too well that student experiences vary greatly depending on the community where a student lives. Sometimes even just depending on the street or where he or she lives. A lot of the student happens to be selected in a school lottery. That is unacceptable uh, in this day and age. Uh, instead, we should be connecting and supporting all students with technology, calling on all we now know about how children learn and the importance of their social and emotional development. These are very big challenges and very important challenges. But the Nick Taft Commission is optimistic about the opportunity that does exist uh, to improve teaching and learning for all teachers and all students. The new federal Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, that several of you have heard about, uh, compels states to uh, create new plans for how to support teaching. ESSA also requires states to engage multiple stakeholders in developing these plans to reach out and bring in people, making education much more exciting. This is our chance right now to begin to really think about these things. We now know more about what is needed in education and how children learn. We now have technologies and tools that can support teaching and learning. We have new ideas about data and evaluation. And now we have the opportunity to develop new roles for teachers. Now that is very serious work. To realize the promise of this opportunity offered by the ESSA, we must uh, put support for teaching uh, at the center of our effort. Uh, Nick Taft is about teachers and teaching, and that's our main focus. We must invest in the power and the potential of dedicated educators who work in our schools and in our school systems. For so long, we have asked our teachers to do too much. In more recent years, for example, uh, we've asked them to respond to changes in standards and assessment, to new language acquisition needs, to children living in poverty and often dealing in trauma, uh, as well as struggling with the way race relations are playing out in our various communities. Uh, now it's time for us uh, to provide our dedicated educators with all the support and resources that they need to succeed and to help their students then succeed. Now, I've been working uh, on this type work for a long time, as, as many of you know, uh, in South Carolina and across the country. And I really do think we have a window of opportunity right here. The new ESSA legislation invites us to look at teaching and learning differently. Of course, that, like so many options, can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing and hold us down. And it's up to us, each of us, every one of us, to ensure that it's a good thing to make the best and the most positive use of this opportunity. We must ensure that all students all across the country uh, have the chance to learn, to grow, to collaborate, to thrive, to become productive, responsible adults. That's our job. What matters now uh, gives us the information and the tools to do just that. Thank you.
you, Secretary Riley. I am happy now to introduce Jal Mehta. Jal is a NICTAF commissioner and an associate professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the principal investigator at the Transforming Teaching Project. Jal is also writing a book about his study of deeper learning schools across the country. We really appreciate his taking time away from this work to be with us here and to be able to share some of the information about the new report with all of you. So Jal, thank you. Morning. Good morning. Um, so thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Secretary Riley. Um, so when Nick Taft published What Matters Most in 1996, the questions of teachers and teacher policy was not yet high on the policy agenda. And today, as evidenced by the folks in this room and a lot of the great work of the people, uh, the folks in this room, the work that they're doing, the landscape is crowded with organizations that are working around teachers and teacher policy. But I want to argue that somewhere along the way that the train, the sort of the big policy train, uh, went a little off the tracks. Uh, so what started as a sensible desire to ensure that students were learning, particularly black, brown, and poor students, became a strategy that was radically overinvested in student test scores as the only indicator of success, and individual teacher evaluation as the primary lever of improvement. Not that those things aren't important in their place, but it's a sort of a question of emphasis. Independent nonpartisan analyses have indicated that this has had the predictable result of narrowing the curriculum, lowering teacher morale, and making it difficult to recruit high quality candidates into teaching. I can remember publishing an op-ed in the Times in 2013 and receiving dozens of letters from older teachers saying that they wouldn't want their children to enter the field uh, today. But I think over the past few years, we may be turning a corner into uh, a new era. The new SLA pushes more power uh, back to the states. Calls for basic skills have given way to desires for deeper learning. The current Democratic presidential candidate seems to take a more holistic and less test score focused vision than her pre predecessor. Um, countries around the world are putting together task, force on task forces on 21st century skills, 21st century learning, trying to figure out how they can transform their industrial era structures into modern learning organizations. And in the US, you know, thousands of people have submitted applications to XQ. The, uh, the White House held a, held a commission on rethinking the, a meeting on rethinking the high school. There's a lot of uh, interest and energy uh, moving in this direction. Okay, so what would this be more concretely? You can see on the uh, pyramid uh, behind me uh, what the, the NICTAF team uh, came out with. Uh, drawing on uh, consultations with hundreds of organizations and numerous opportunities for public input. So one way to think about the problem in American education is it's sort of a problem of control. And a big part of the problem in American schooling traditionally has been that you have federal government trying to control states and states trying to control districts and districts trying to control schools and principals trying to control teachers and teachers trying to control students. And that's not the way that good education happens. Um, and so this report basically takes the opposite vision. So we've sort of inverted the pyramid. What we want for students is at the top, and what the system needs to do to build the infrastructure to support that uh, is at the bottom. Uh, and so it leads with what we know about uh, student learning. And uh, to boil down you know, 30 years of research in cognitive science and youth development, uh, students need to be challenged. They need to feel like they belong in school, and they need to see a purpose for their learning. Um, and we are currently struggling on all of those fronts. So if you look at analyses of the kinds of tasks that students are asked to do in school, about 80% of those tasks fall in the bottom half of Bloom's taxonomy, being asked to recall, understand, and apply, as opposed to analyze, synthesize, and create. That's from a Gates Met study. Ed Trust did a study of middle school tasks and found about 13% of tasks really uh, Challenge kids, Rand did a study again and again. It comes back about one out of five classrooms uh, really challenges kids to think. So that's sort of one side of the equation. And then the other side is about engagement. If you look at those Gallup student poll results, they show that in fifth grade, about 70% of students report that they are engaged in school. And then there's just this direct downward line. And by senior year, about 36% of students report they're engaged in school. And you have to be in school to fill out the poll. So uh, <laughs> students who, not, this, it's funny, but uh, you know, we have a serious dropout problem. So 
and we know that being disengaged with school is the biggest reason why students drop out. So uh, those numbers would be lower if we counted the students who weren't, who weren't there. Okay. Uh, so I've been studying powerful or deep learning in high schools over the past five years, and there is bad news and good news. Uh, the bad news is that uh, some of the schools that are touted as sort of leaders in the sort of 21st century skills movement are still fairly uneven. If you really go there and you spend a whole day with the students and you look at the quality of the projects and so on and so forth, you'll see that there are highlights, but there are also, there's also a lot of work to be done. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news is that, um, is that uh, there are pockets in classrooms, departments, in pretty much every school. If we left this building and we walked to the nearest school and we asked students, you know, which teachers do you really feel excited in their classes, and we asked parents, we would find some in almost every, uh, in every school. Uh, we would see this in interdisciplinary projects, we would see it in debate clubs, we would see it in student newspapers, we would see it in discussions of Shakespeare, we would see it on athletic fields, we would see it in green engineering, design thinking, you name it. There are lots of exciting things going on in lots of different schools uh, around the country. Uh, and many of these spaces draw on the principles of positive youth development. They create opportunities for students to belong, to form relationships with adults, to work on the same problems at increasing levels of sophistication. So all the sort of extracurriculars, theater, um, sports, et cetera, you're sort of doing the same things over and over in more complicated ways. There's apprenticeship uh, with adults. Uh, and there are opportunities to perform and to take pride and ownership in the kind of work uh, that you're doing. Uh, and these are the these are the kind of schools that I would want for my sons. You know that old Dewey line, like, would you want for what would you want for the system? What you would want for your own kids? My kids are three and five and a half. If they had those kinds of experiences, I would appreciate it. And they're also the kind that are likely to meet the demands of the new economy. So if you asked employers in 1970 what are the top three skills you want, they said reading, writing, and arithmetic. And if you ask them today, they say problem solving, teamwork, and interpersonal skills. Okay, so if that's what we want for our students, then as we sort of move down the pyramid, uh, then we need to create something similar for teachers. Schools need to be organized in ways that are less siloed, that fuse work and play, and they give teachers chances to collaborate and develop their passion. Student passion often follows from teacher passion. So we deny teachers opportunities to experience passion at our peril. Much as we scaffold for students, we need to scaffold for teachers. Early career teachers need substantial support in curricular materials. More experienced teachers need opportunities to mentor and develop new lessons and materials. And there are no shortage of models for how to do this, many of them developed uh, by folks in this room. Uh, the question is just how could we make it more uh, systematic? So very concretely, the report suggests that each state needs to create a commission on the future of te teaching and learning that would chart an agenda for a learning system for the 21st century. And we would suggest that state coalitions, coalitions, including leading districts, teacher prep providers, business groups, parents, teachers, and students, parents, teachers, and students, can't be another, I can't use these words in this kind of setting, but this can't be another one of those like confabs among folks that doesn't lead to sort of changes on the ground. It needs to be grounded in real folks who work in schools. Um, um, uh, need to develop a vision and then they need to assess where they are in moving uh, towards that vision. So if the U.S. Uh, gymnast last night said that uh, they were the final five, we are looking for a first five, a set of uh, states and districts that uh, want to take up uh, this work. In particular, we argue that there's sort of three big arenas that they, should, uh, that they should be assessing themselves against and then working to make progress on. The first is creating a teacher pipeline. Schools are only as good as the people who work in them, and a sensible system would have a vertically integrated system that put together a plan to recruit teachers starting as early as high school, uh, develop a year of high quality residency induction, and create roles for teacher leaders and master teachers to mentor and anchor such a system. We know from the literature on expertise that expertise builds slowly and over time, and so if we don't develop a sort of coherent vertically integrated strategy, students aren't going to get the kind of uh, teaching that they deserve. So that's the teacher piece, and Nick Taff has been advocating for that from its uh, inception. Um, the second issue is organizing schools for success. 
uh, from studies of effective schools, Catholic schools, charter schools, we have a fairly good idea of what it takes for schools to succeed. And these are things that would help other organizations as well. Clear missions, extensive time for teachers to collaborate, intentional structures for professional learning, consistent norms, and high expectations for students. Like we've known this since Ron Edmonds in 1979. Um, and then schools that meet the needs of the new century will have all of these plus opportunities for collaboration across disciplines chances for students to publicly demonstrate their knowledge, of sk knowledge and skill, and opportunities to integrate what happens in school with youth organizations and other uh, out-of-school actors. If we organize schools this way so that there were significant opportunities for uh, student and adult learning, it would connect to the teacher pipeline piece because it would be easier to retain teachers as a recent study by um, John Pape and Matt Kraft shows that in schools which are good environments for teachers, it's not surprisingly easier to retain them. Uh, and then the third issue is race uh, and equity, which overlaps with the other two. On the teacher side, this means we can't have a nation where we have a majority minority, won't be my majority minority, that's almost a misnomer, uh, a majority of students of color, a majority of the students in the U.S. being students of color and a teaching force that's 83% white. Like, that is a clear problem that uh, we need to take on. It also means that all teachers, regardless of their race, will need to expand their cultural competen competence and understand how their own racial identities shape who they are and how they teach. It means attending to issues of resource distribution across schools, uh, including the distribution of high quality teachers. And this again is connected to the issue of organizing schools for success. If in high poverty communities, more schools are organized as high efficacy places, more teachers as they gain seniority will want to continue to work uh, in those schools. On the student side, it means that we need to make sure that schools are places where all students feel known, are connected to at least one, one adult, and cri critically that they see all school subjects at places where they belong and can excel. This is a big agenda, but it's possible. If you read the longer report that Melinda referred to and Elizabeth slaved over, uh, <laughs> you will see lots and lots of links to particular schools, district, teacher prep organizations, states that have made progress on these agendas. And so I urge you, if what is happening here is too general to meet your needs, to check out the report and look for specific places that are particular to what you're uh, doing. Um, um, and so seeing those examples, the question is, like, could we build on those examples and make it more uh, systemic? Uh, what we need is the will to move it forward and to create the kind of legacy that we owe the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Both Secretary Riley and Jal mentioned that Nick Taff has always been about teaching and teachers. And so it's my pleasure to introduce one of our Nick Taff commissioners, Genevieve DeBose, who is a seventh grade English language arts teacher at the Bronx School for Writers and Artists in New York, um, who is going to, to really bring to you all today why what's happening and what matters now is so critical to what happens to Genevieve and her colleagues in schools across this country. So Genevieve, I welcome you. Thank you, Melinda, and so good to see so many of you here today. Why do you teach? I teach to transform society, create a new urban reality. Why do you teach? I teach to transform society urban reality why do you teach I teach to transform society create a new world reality I'll never forget one of my proudest moments as a teacher it happened this spring in my seventh grade English language arts class in the South Bronx in New York City my students and I were at the tail end of a unit on scholar activism and their culminating project asked them to identify a problem in our school community, in our local Hunts Point community, or in the larger New York City community that needed to be solved. They had to research to identify root causes, share ways the community could get involved, and interview people affected by the issue, among other things. One of my seventh graders, let's just call him Hope, was standing in front of the room with a set of Google Slides he had developed, giving a presentation on transphobia in New York City. Hmm. 
Hope was born female, and in the middle of his seventh grade year, he let us know that he identifies as a boy and asked us to use the pronouns he, him, and his when referring to him. Hope stood up there that June afternoon and gave us tips about what we could do to help end transphobia in New York. See or hear a transphobic person? Call them out. Be open-minded when, when you engage with someone who is transgender. And to quote him directly, talk to trans people. Me and a lot of people in this school and in Hunts Point, Hunts Point are trans. If you know someone and they're comfortable with you asking, ask about what it's like. Watching Hope standing in front of his adolescent peers and speaking his truth gave me goosebumps. I was proud. I was proud of his bravery and academic scholarship. I was proud that we had created a community and culture in our classroom where my students felt safe enough to be their full selves. A hard feat at any point in life, but especially as a seventh grader. And I was proud that my students were using their reading, writing, listening, speaking, and researching skills to work towards creating a more just and equitable society. You see, that same day that Hope educated us about transphobia in New York City, another student taught us about suicide awareness and another about the Black Lives Matter movement and the killing of unarmed black men and women by police officers. My students were using the skills they had learned over the course of the year to educate their community about issues that affected them. What more could a teacher ask for? So I tell you the story of Hope because our schools are changing. As Secretary Riley said, our demographics are changing. And now that isn't to say that we haven't always had transgender students in our schools, but the climate and culture of today's schools is shifting. And our opportunity for progress, and our opportunity to disrupt the current system that chooses to educate only some of our students, couldn't be greater. Today, most of our 66 million public school students are students of color. 51% of our, of our, of our kids qualify for free and reduced lunch, 4 million are English language learners, and 6 million students have identified disabilities or special needs. For some of us, this has always been the case. We've always taught in schools that are high need, but for many of us, these shifts are new. And we're at this crucial and unique point where we can keep doing what we're doing knowing that it doesn't meet the needs of our students or their teachers, or we can actually reorganize schools to support great teaching and drive real, authentic, and relevant learning. I am so proud that as a classroom practitioner, I am part of the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future. And I'm also incredibly proud to have been part of the team of many who helped create this report, What Matters Now, a compact for new teaching and learning. Because what matters now is that we work together to create conditions, systems, and structures that support our students to have the skills and dispositions to make informed, evidence-based decisions about important things like who our next leader will be and how we respond in times of crisis. What matters now is that we as a nation collectively agree that our black and Latino students and our children living in poverty are just as important, just as valuable, just as intelligent and matters as much as their white, Asian, and upper income peers. What matters now is that we see the shift in demographics as a welcome opportunity for changing teaching and learning as opposed to viewing it as a barrier. And what matters now is that we stop talking and actually start doing. That we stand in front of each other here today or back in our schools, in our state and district offices, in our homes, and just like my student Hope, who courageously stood in front of his peers, we make a declaration and then take action to create change. Hope wanted to mobilize us to end transphobia in New York City. And we, as the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future, are issuing a call to mobilize teachers, families, students, policymakers, and the broader community around a new vision for teaching and learning, 
one that transforms our current reality into a more equitable, organized, and responsive one. So why do you teach? I teach to transform society, create a new urban reality. Why do you teach? I teach to transform society, create a new urban reality. Why do you teach? I teach to transform society, create a new world reality. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. One of the most exciting parts of, of my job is, is getting to work with teachers and to understand some of what you shared today. And, and so it's very powerful when you're able to, to bring it to us here. So thank you for that. We are thrilled to now have a, a panel of teachers who are here today to provide us with their perspectives on what excites them about these new approaches to learning, what they themselves are doing to teach differently, and how they're taking on new roles. So I'm going to invite the panel to come on up. Um, we've talked a lot about using agency, and so we are very encouraged by these teachers who are joining us today and teachers across this country who are using their agency to improve professional learning and to provide advice to policymakers at this critical time. It's always Nick Taft's goal to elevate the experience and opinions of teachers when we talk about policy and systems. So we appreciate these teachers joining us today. I want to also introduce our moderator, Fred Frelo. It's the senior program officer at the Ford Foundation. Fred actually started with Nick Taft when Nick Taft first started. And so he has, it's amazing to have him here um, as a commissioner and as, a, as somebody who can lead us in this conversation with teachers who has dedicated his work to improving education for all these years and has been with Nick Taft really since the start on the staff and now today as a commissioner. So thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Uh, Genevieve, that was just marvelous. Thank you so very much. And it sort of leads me to my first question to the uh, panel here. I, 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 don't want to introduce you. I want you all to take a couple minutes to introduce yourselves and to talk about why do you teach? We start at the end of here. Hi, my name is Stephanie Spangler, and I'm a fourth grade ELA teacher at a DC public school in Columbia Heights. Um, this will be my, which is crazy to say, this will be my fifth year in the classroom. And I started teaching because I was really interested in education policy and issues of, of equity um, and social justice. And I think the reason that I've stayed is that I've discovered that the actual work of teaching and learning is incredibly complex and presents a different challenge every hour of every day. And so I never get bored. And that's why I teach. <laughs> My name is Joanna Scamizzi. I teach uh, high school biology in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm a national board certified teacher. Um, I'm a Hope Street Group fellow. I've been a part of a couple different national fellowships and I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I started teaching um, because I loved biology. I had a teacher who made me ask, not answer questions, but ask questions. Why and how are like my two favorite words. Um, and, but I actually stayed because of what Stephanie said she started, because as I continued teaching, I realized that while I love the content that I was teaching, um, I entered teaching thinking I wanted to teach students who wanted to learn. I'll be really honest. That's how I started. I want to teach students who want to learn. And I learned that all students want to learn, but that I was most effective with students who I needed to help them find that they wanted to learn, who entered my class um, not interested in learning for whatever reason, and most of it was equity and access. Um, but by the time they left me, they were like, I don't want to leave. I want to stay. And what, do you teach chemistry next year? Can I have you next year? Um, and so I, I have stayed in teaching. Um, I'm actually this year teaching just with North Carolina's virtual public schools. Um, I'm sure teacher flexible roles will come up, but I just adopted a new baby boy. And I get to stay teaching kids because I can now do it from home in a more flexible role. 
Um, my name is Rachel Hull, and I currently teach fifth grade humanities at Capital City Public Charter School in Northwest DC, which is an expeditionary learning school. Um, I come to DC um, by way of West Virginia. I taught in the classroom for almost 19 years, and then I would, uh, led the work at the West Virginia Department of Education, um, transitioning elementary teachers. I was the first elementary coordinator. I couldn't believe nobody had ever championed the, the world of elementary teachers before me, but I was the first in, in working for the West Virginia Department of Education. And I did a lot of professional development, but I returned to the classroom because that's really my first love. And what I love about teaching in those early days, um, it was about the creativity and um, constantly rolling with the punches. And I loved trying to think of the most creative way and to especially hook people who were disenfranchised with education. I loved working with girls who hated math because I hated math. <laughs> and I became, I tried to um, expand my practice. Um, and so Marilyn Burns is my girl. Um, but um, I wanted to hook that student. And so it really pulled out of me my own creativity. So I love that. But now that I'm old, um, the thing that I love most are the relationships. This is the first summer that I've been off that I don't have a child at home or other obligations. My daughter's 24, and she's actually moving into education herself, and I have miss I've always missed my students, but since it's just my husband, my dog, and me, um, I need my students. I need them in my life, and um, I love all that they bring to the classroom, and they enrich my life. So um, when you mix all of those things together, teaching is the best job. I returned to it. I could make more money um, being a consultant, but mm, no, I want to die happy, and that's in the classroom. <laughs> Hi, my name is Keisha George, and I am a school testing coordinator. Excuse me, school testing coordinator in Prince George's County Public Schools, and this is my 14th year in education. And I love the process and the journey of learning. I love to see students come alive. Um, I guess I'm still in teaching because I'm selfish. I'm actually rewarded, rewarded from their success, rewarded again from their journey, and I love to see our students go out into the world and be change agents. So that's why I'm here, and I will continue to do the work while I'm here. Thank you very, very much. That was terrific. So let's begin at the beginning. The, this report and others have talked about teacher preparation. Um, so for you, what was the most valuable part of your teacher preparation experience, and given the shifts in demography and classrooms, what would you encourage um, teacher preparation providers to consider as they plan for new teachers? So let's start with you this time. Okay, very well. Um, well, I, was, I started as a provisional teacher, so this is actually my second career, um, and I didn't go through the traditional route, so a lot of my training was on the job training. Um, one thing that I think that prep programs need to make sure that they include is building self-efficacy. I think it's so important for our students to really believe in their ability to learn, to achieve. I see that lacking in our classrooms, and I think that it is key to our students' success. So building self-efficacy. Um, in my experience, I went to college before, you know, you composed on the computer. I still use typewriters. So I'm the oldest person in my school, so I'm very aware that I'm speaking from that, that viewpoint. Um, last night, in thinking about what questions we might be asked, I, really, teacher prep was where I kept going. And what made me love teaching really boiled it down to two people, my one, one single professor and my supervising student teacher. It was the relationship that I had with those two people that really caused me to love teaching and made me want to stay in it when, when things were uh, tough. and But in thinking about that, and I was listening um, to one of the speakers, and when they're talking about the teacher pipeline, and we want to pull the best into the classroom. And I look, looked at this graphic on page 16 of your, um, of your document, and it says, our vision of teaching and learning. And there are four descriptions about the student, critical thinker, communicator, collaborator, and creative problem solver. And in thinking about teacher prep programs and who we want into the classroom, this really is key to what I know that's going to, that these um, 
this is what we need students to be able to do. We need teachers who've experienced this as a student and also know how to create that happening in the classroom because this is where the really hard work is happening. It's not in, being, in pulling out a, a book and you know going on to the next page, which is kind of how we've done at teaching and, and had education in our classrooms. So we need to identify teachers or students in high school that are critical thinkers, that are communicators, collaborators, and creative problem solvers, and move those people into the classroom, beg them to become teachers because those are the skills and they need to be the foundation of teacher prep programs. Um, one note and I'll, I'll move on but one last thing was um, in college I spent all this time and I know it was a different era but I spent all this time learning how to make games, uh, bulletin boards um, and those things I loved. I loved sitting, cutting things out all night long, using it in the letterpress. I loved that part of it. But that's really not what teachers need today. I can buy all of that things. We have those things. We have technology. That's not what I spend my time doing anymore. So we still have uh, uh, archaic programs, I think, because we're still doing cute things and we're not getting into the really hard, messy work of creating critical thinkers, communicators, uh, collaborators, and creative problem solvers. Yeah, to build on what Rachel said, um, the, the question what best prepared me. I was a traditional teacher prep um, in some ways, but I was actually a dance major um, and biology major. I double majored, and I spent a lot of time with children growing up teaching dance and being in theater, and so um, I think that, you know, to Rachel's point about really fostering that creativity and learning how to interact in groups with students and read students, I think one of my greatest skills is being able to look out at a crowd and be like, you're really engaged in what I'm saying, or you're not. I should try to be, I should put on my top shoes for a second. Um, and I think that teachers who really understand the arts um, actually bring something really different to their classrooms. Um, and when I think about what I most desperately needed in my teacher prep that I didn't get, it was a real solid grounding in, and Genevieve tweeted she wants to go to Harvard and get her PhD, and I was like, I'll come with you. <laughs> um, because I, I didn't get a really solid grounding in evidence-based research, mm -hmm. and I didn't get a really solid grounding until I got my master's in cultural competencies. And I really think that um, as valuable as it is to recruit people to come in as a second career, um, we really set a lot of teachers up to not stay past those five years, those first five years, because there's so much they don't know they don't know. And um, there is so much that is known that we're really, you know, when you talk about teachers as professionals, we don't read professional journals. You look at a doctor, they get and read professional journals. That's a part of their profession, and that's not a part of most teachers' profession. Getting national board certified, like every doctor you go to is mostly board certified. Why is not every teacher teaching your students nationally board certified? So I think we're really missing out on a lot of the pedagogical content knowledge. Um, so I came to teaching through an alternative certification program here in DC called the Capital Teaching Residency and the structure of the program is in the first year you're a resident you're not a teacher of record so I was placed in a first grade classroom with an experienced teacher in a KIPP charter school um, and in a lot of ways there were a lot of gaps uh, it was definitely a crash course in terms of curriculum and research and all those things but I think the one thing that was really positive was that I was just able to watch her manage a classroom for a year. And that is such a nuanced skill that you really cannot get from a textbook. And I still, in my mind, go back to memories of her and the way she handled different situations and, and just the, the community and the pride that she built with a group of six-year-olds. Um, and I think about that still in my fifth year of teaching. like. What would Vanessa do in this situation? And sometimes I call her and ask her what she would do. And so I think that's something that we really need to think about in teacher prep is how are we building mentors? How are we giving people those opportunities to see it in the classroom? Because some of it just cannot translate from a piece of paper. Uh, so Joanna, we'll start with you with this question. Um, in the report, uh, uh, the, the writers uh, write, we must move away from a focus on individual teachers toward a vision of teaching as a collective endeavor. The way teachers work and learn together should model the way we want students to work together. So if you think this is right, which I think you do, um, what needs to happen to make this shift? 
Sure, I'll, I'll speak from two different um, points. One is as a traditional um, high school teacher, and I think it really we really need creative school leaders who don't see a school as 52 separate classrooms, and maybe you work as a department, and then maybe you work just the biology teachers together. I think um, that is a very archaic system that really creative school leaders value way beyond that. They value sending your teachers up to the university to see what's happening there and sending them down to the middle school to see what's happening there and sending a science teacher into a history classroom and a lot more cross-content collaboration. But I'll also speak from the point of a, a virtual teacher. So I actually work um, with North Carolina Virtual Public Schools with students who have severe and profound disabilities and can't be in um, a, a traditional classroom. They're in a self-contained classroom. And so I'm the content expert who works with their EC Exceptional Children's teacher who leads Leads the students and so we work virtually and I think that really bringing in this broader network of not just seeing beyond your school but seeing beyond your district and your state and the the true value of all the tools that are available to teachers to collaborate you know getting teachers on Twitter chats I love Twitter chats and it surprises me the number of teachers who who haven't been exposed to that which is such a valuable tool for that collaboration and our students are on social media all the time and so to teach Teach teachers how to be good stewards of using social media and technology um, because then teachers can model that for their students. So I think that um, this idea of creativity and seeing beyond traditional walls is one of the most important things for collaboration. Going down that way, then we'll come. Okay, great. Um, for me, I think there needs to be some serious innovation around time for teachers. I just don't think that there is enough time in the day for a teacher to do everything that they need to do to design these really rich, deep 21st century experiences. At the elementary school level, um, we have IEP meetings, we have culture and climate meetings, we have curriculum meetings, we have school initiative meetings, we have parent meetings, and all of that is supposed to happen in 55 minutes of planning every day. Um, and so I think if we're really going to take seriously the intellectual rigor of the instruction that we're asking teachers and students to move towards, we have got to figure out a way to redesign the day to give teachers more than 40 minutes to talk about the scope and sequence for the next six weeks. It's just not going to work. Um, and I think we... Amen. <laughs> And I think we all know those things, and we all know that it doesn't make sense, but it's really hard to, to figure out the, the human capital piece of it. Like, you know, at my school, my principal is super supportive of professional development opportunities. But that means that she comes in my classroom and subs the day for me so that I can go. So then she's pulled away from what she's supposed to be doing. So we really need some, some serious innovation around structure of staffing and the day and how we can create more time for these things. Actually, I'm going to come with that conversation. I believe that it really starts from the state and the district level. They have to put in place mandates where they allow for teachers to experience professional learning through collaboration. It starts there. Um, so it starts with leadership. And then once you have that, once you have that in place, your leaders have to be willing to carry on professional learning. They have to be um, advocates for professional learning in the building. They need to make sure that they build leadership capacity with your teacher leaders. And once we get to the teachers, in order for them to truly collaborate, they also have to build relationships with each other. They have to build trust with each other. Um, sometimes you find that some teachers are not really willing to collaborate because they're fearful. They're fearful that someone else may find out that they're not able to allow their students to be critical thinkers. So we have to get past that. So building relationships and building trust at the teacher level in order for us to truly collaborate and then have outstanding academic achievement for our students. Um, in thinking about this, um, these practices that are embedded in the deeper learning construct and the, uh, that call for collaboration, feedback differentiation, those kinds of, of things. As a classroom teacher, when I left the classroom and I, I became what I considered an advocate for teachers at the West Virginia Department of Ed, I made this comment. Teachers cheered. Administrators didn't like it. I didn't care. Um, but I, for example, what deeper learning is messy. 
And what you're asking teachers to do is it's really messy. All the while you're having to decide, um, can this kid get a drink of water? Do these parents want to talk to you? You have all these meetings. It's about this juggling act. But one of the things that I found that was disheartening as a classroom teacher was I was expected to differentiate, which I understood and I did. And it asking me to, to differentiate all these um, levels and needs of my students Above me, nobody differentiated my professional development. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to ask me to collaborate, you better collaborate all the way up. Or as a classroom teacher, I'm checking out and not going to support you. Um, if you aren't welcome to feedback, don't ask me to give feedback or accept your feedback if you don't accept it from me. It has to be reciprocal. And you're going. And if you want to engage teachers and reignite that passion and ask them to engage in deeper learning, then you have to do the same thing you're asking teachers to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it falls on deaf ears and I wrote down on my paper what's good for the goose is good for the gander and so we have to operate that way it's about um it's about shared accountability and if we want that shared accountability then we have to be authentic from the bottom to all the way to the policy makers in Washington so it has to happen and, and, and so you all kind of talked at that upper level but as a classroom teacher I really resent it and I check out if we have a new initiative that is not authentic all the way down for what you're asking me to do. I have time for one more question. Uh, another uh, quote from the report, and uh, we'll start at the end. Um, Stephanie, I guess it is. It's Stephanie, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, efforts to make learning more real life, technology enabled and extended beyond school has required us to identify new sets of competencies and roles to be effective. The teacher must now take on new roles as teacher leaders, and there's a there's a set of other things. Now, some of you already talked about uh, teacher leaders and teacher roles, but what do you think of that? And, and and specifically, what types of roles, if you can name uh, one or two, that really are generally not in place now that need to be in place? So DCS has actually done a lot of work with leading educators and the teacher leadership initiative, and we have a lot of teacher leadership roles in DCPS. Um, so I think I'll speak about like why I find them so effective, and I think it connects to what was in the report about shared decision making. So at my school, we have multiple teacher leaders. We have now LEAP coaches, which is another leadership initiative. And because teachers are in the room when decisions are made, uh, you, you avoid this sort of like, okay, here's someone else telling me what to do. Um, teachers made the decisions about the schedule at my school. Teachers made the decision about the coaching cycles. Teachers made the decisions about which teacher was going to be in which PD group. And so you don't get the break room complaining because you made the decisions. Um, and I think that's really powerful for teacher morale at our school. And it also motivates me because I see teacher leaders at my school where I'm like, if I keep working hard and I keep striving, I could one day be that leader too without having to leave the classroom. So I think that's why I'm really excited with all the work that DCPS has done with teacher leadership. I think this idea of different teacher roles is, is one of the most important things that we can really tackle um, because teachers are creative and they want to be challenged and although each year and each set of students is a new challenge, um, sometimes you can get um, very I've done this for a while, and I don't want to turn into the teacher who pulls out the same lesson plan from three years ago and does it the same exact way, and I think that a variety of teacher roles will really help with that. Um, to me, my favorite people in the world to work with are new teachers because they come in with such excitement and such energy, um, and so I think to me that's a really specific role that at least in a lot of schools now has gotten cut is who's working with new teachers. It talks about it in the report that sometimes it's not even who volunteered, it's who was told to work with new teachers, and um, what a shame that we're not really setting new teachers up by having them be with the most empowered and impassioned teachers. Um, and right now when we do do that, it's just another thing that you're doing on top of this very, very busy day that Stephanie talked about before. And so I think that really taking time to look at how we compensate and inspire and train mentors and new teacher supports is a huge investment that we'll really see a return on. 
Um, I think when we invest in teachers and empower teachers, it's, it's about empowering them to be a better broker. So as a classroom teacher, because I teach in an expeditionary learning school, I'm kind of in the middle of, of, of deeper learning co um, conversations and practice and implementation. And what I have had to do, and I'm glad to do it, and um, in my role, I have got to learn how to be a better broker of quality. When I tap into community resources, what's the best community resource to bring into my classroom? Um, if I'm designing a lesson, I have to be a broker of, of choosing what is the best instructional strategy to, to use at this point. Um, but I'm also having to think about what is the best um, question that I ask a student that actually pulls them along. You're constantly having to broker and having to juggle and have all of this. So sometimes it's about hmm, looking at what your options are and making this choice. But so many of the brokering that we do is on our feet and in the middle of a set of a setting, maybe it's sometimes a difficult setting. Maybe you have a student who's struggling. So it's about empowering teachers and giving them the expertise in order to be a better broker, a broker of the moment, a broker of all the, um, the um, decisions that they do have to make in all these different settings. So how do we empower um, teachers to do that? And um, part of it's a personal um, journey, but all, it has to be collective as well. I think you mentioned new roles. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure if we need new roles. I think we have teacher leaders. Mm -hmm. We have mentors. Mm -hmm. In our um, system, we have peer assistance review teachers who are there to mentor our new teachers. But it's the time, as we all mentioned, it's the time. The time, do we give time to those teacher leaders to help develop those new teachers and maybe those not so new teachers, but teachers who can, who can benefit from collaborative planning, who can benefit from learning new instructional strategies. It's time, it's taking time to really develop the roles that we already have in place. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say I'm, I'm giving kudos to my um, county, to my district, for hiring new mentor teachers. So in the state of Maryland, you're supposed to have one mentor for every 15 new teachers. Well, in our district, we had one mentor for every 41 teachers. That just doesn't work. <laughs> that won't work. So this year, they hired additional teachers. So even though we're not hitting the 1 to 15 mark, we're now down to 1 to 23. So we're, we're making progress. So we need time, and we need the resources to make sure that we have those people in place to help our teachers. Well, everyone, thank you so very, very much. Uh, on behalf of everyone. I too want to thank this amazing panel. Um, as the mom of two daughters, I can say that this is what makes me happy to be sending my kids to school, is this kind of energy and excitement and passion about the profession. And so I thank you all for your service as teachers and for being here today to share these important insights with all of us. I would like to go ahead and invite our next panel to come up to the podium. This next panel, so when I get to talk about why I enjoy my job so much, it's because I get to work with a set of commissioners who represent all parts of this big system and enterprise of teaching and learning. And they are experienced and smart and passionate. And all of these folks have agreed today to draw upon their own experiences to discuss how we go about implementing this new system of learning. And I promise that this will be a lively conversation, and it will also give you a peek into some of what our around the table commission discussions have looked like. As a staff, we're continually learning from these experts. We're humbled at their abilities to help synthesize these discussions, and we are very pleased that you all are here um, with us today. So I'm pleased to introduce Monica Martinez, who is a NICTAF commissioner. She's a senior advisor to the Hewlett Foundation and an appointee to the White House Commission of Educational Excellence for Hispanics. Monica and her colleague have written a book that has wonderful case studies of eight schools working to achieve deeper learning outcomes for students. And Monica has been a real friend to NICTAF, um, working with us over a number of years in helping to shape the direction of the organization. And so I'm so pleased to have you lead this discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. <laughs> but, but
really a big thanks to the teachers. It's always so hard to follow teachers. You guys made it real. <laughs> uh, music to my ears to hear the words deeper learning, <laughs> uh, to hear about the, the projects and the deep um, teaching you guys are doing for understanding, for critical thinking. So thank you for making our day so real and grounding us. And so with this panel, we're actually going to hopefully support all the work you do by, um, by really talking about how can the system support great teaching? How can the system support these teachers and everything they just shared with us around shared leadership, around the need for time, resources, what's happening at states, what's happening at districts. So we're very fortunate to have a panel that kind of represents all these levels of the system. So we're not going to take too much of a federalism approach, but a little bit of a top-down type approach. And um, we're going to start off with Ellen Moyer. And you guys heard a few conversations around mentors and around induction. And Ellen is the founder and chief executive of New Teacher Center, a national organization dedicated to improving student learning by accelerating the effectiveness of new teachers and school leaders. And Ellen has grown this organization from a small, probably five-person shop to a multi-million, double-digit number. I don't know what we did about induction before we had the New Teacher Center. Center. So she's going to kind of keep with the practice theme, start that way, and build on what she sees around induction. And then we're going to move into teacher preparation. We heard a little bit about that, uh, what teacher preparation can do to really develop and support teachers and how we design our teacher preparation programs. And so Rick, Rick Schwab is going to be talking about that, and he's a dean. At the, uh, he, he's a dean for the uh, he's dean emeritus, I guess, uh, at the School of Education for the University of Connecticut. And then we're also really privileged to have Kaya Henderson with us here today. And I think probably Kaya needs no introduction, uh, but she is the chancellor of the District of Columbia Public Schools. And we heard some really great stories about how DCPS is supporting teachers. And I'm sure that Kaya will will build on that. So um, and then you know couldn't have a better closer than Michelle Cahill. Uh, Michelle is a distinguished fellow in education and youth development at the National. Center for Civic Innovation, but she's also the senior advisor to the XQ Institute, which we hope will help continue to revolutionize our schools and to change teaching for the 21st century. Uh, many of you may have known Michelle and her role as the vice president um, for Carnegie Foundation in New York. So again, I'm just going to pass it on to these amazing panelists and uh, lead with Ellen to build on what our teachers talked about earlier. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have all of you care as much as we do about what matters now. Um, I am just, I'm a little emotional actually after listening to Genevieve, Keisha, Rachel, Joanne, and Stephanie. That was really powerful. And I'm not in very many meetings where I hear the voices of our teachers. So let me just begin by saying that our country in the next 10 years is going to need upwards of 1.5 million No surprise to you, with me being the CEO of the New Teacher Center, that I'm super excited about Nick Taft's call out around multi-year induction and mentoring. But, but let's be clear. I'm not talking about good job, Kaya. Nice going, Monica. Here's a donut. <laughs> I'm talking about a rigorous, robust, instructionally focused, action-oriented partnership with new teachers so that they can get on the path to excellence like the teachers we just heard. If we leave teachers in our toughest schools with a sink or swim experience, the most underserved kids in America will get a leaky bucket of teachers and be abandoned year after year after year. I'm haunted by that. I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you had I not had Miss Hayward, my high school Spanish teacher. In this country, what matters most now is elevating the teaching profession, is linking these pieces around pipeline, schools that are organized for student success and teacher success, and equity and social justice. We can't be siloed, but rather a collective that's driven to ensure that every child, no matter their zip code, gets the best education. So what does a two-year, a multi-year induction program look like? It means 
first of all, that it's an approach, a program with strong content, with strong professional development that tees a teacher up from the get-go to get the habits of mind and practices to be on the way to National Board Certified Teachers if they so desire. It's about finding the most talented teachers and creating new roles with time to mint. Like, if you have 45 new teachers in your caseload, you may as well stop spending your money. So this is about now what matters most is that the investments we use actually are leveraged to drive for an impact on student success, both academic, social, emotional, and community success. So in our work, let's just say in any large urban district, I mean, this last year, in partnership with large urban districts, we had mentors from the districts, rigorously selected, rigorously selected, having a caseload of new teachers and or still teaching and having one or two new teachers, because I think you can do it either way. In the end, though, it's about rich feedback, accelerating the teacher's reflection and ability to know who she's reaching, how she's reaching her students or his students. And it's about an assessment that's ongoing with feedback and a set of outcomes linked to student learning. In these contexts where new teachers are mentored weekly, someone's in their classroom. No one was ever in my classroom for the first two years. Someone's in there, there's expert teachers in their classroom every week. We're seeing new teachers' students scoring three to five months more on standardized test score, so greater learning than new teachers who are just getting whatever a district might be offering. Now, we can do this better. In large urban districts, we're upping retention by 30%. So out of 1,400 new teachers, before we were there, they had about 72% retention. When we're there, you up that by 30%. I want to just say to all of us, and to all of you, that what matters now is that education be the foundation of our democracy and that every child get the best support and every teacher get the kind of love, feedback, and instructional support that they need to be successful. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on to our dean uh, to talk a little bit about the perspective around teacher preparation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that I started in the teacher education business as a researcher, scholar, and a, uh, and a professor in a teacher ed program in 1980. I wasn't very proud of being a teacher educator in 1980. Today, I'm very proud. While there's great variation still in our teacher preparation institutions, I think we've made great leaps forward. What I've uh, kind of put together really briefly is what, from my perspective, from the research and being in hundreds of different programs and doing countless program evaluations, what are the components of a really effective teacher preparation program? Now, that can be a residency program, it could be at a state college, or it could be at where all my experiences are at research ones. So the first um, component of an effective teacher education program is having a strong content base. You can't teach something unless you know something. I mean, that's, that's a given. The next component is entry, selection, and recruiting. Not taking everybody and then weeding out a few, but saying, who has our greatest potential and let's invest in those. So the first thing you need in recruitment is you need an active, thoughtful recruitment policy to recruit teachers of color and male teachers into the profession. It's not just good enough to take the brightest and best off the top. You have to make sure you have the brightest and best from all backgrounds. And this is something that we need to do and should be a part of every good teacher preparation program in this country. Part of your entry should be, what are your grades? How do you stick to it? What do you know? It should be also, how do you interact with people? We do um, we'll give you examples at the University of Connecticut. In our program, we have a five-year integrated bachelor's, master's program. You don't get in until your junior year. Your first two grade years' grades are looked at. You go through an interview process. Your writing statement is looked at. Your references of working with kids. Your content preparation, your initial test scores before you step in the door. 
Um, that's important. Um, the next th thing that's a really important process that has to happen during the teacher education program is that you have to have pedagogical courses that are, re are that relate to practice, that are practice-based learning. And at UConn, you don't start in the teacher ed program to your junior year, but every pedagogical course has a clinic in a school and it has a seminar after that clinic. So you get theory, demonstration, practice, feedback, what we know. Um, the next thing that needs to happen is that these have to happen and your teacher education program has to be built in partnerships and I feel very strongly about this. We have been involved with nine schools for over for close to 30 years now. This is not the flavor of the month. In our teacher ed programs, we just finished a major revision of our five-year program. All nine professional development schools spent a year and a half with us redesigning that program. It wasn't us coming to them and say, we have an idea, how do you react? It was them from the beginning working with us to redesign and enhance our program, which I think was already strong. In our PDSs, our students go through three years of clinical experiences with those teachers. We have a professor who's identified for each school site who is that site coordinator. We have a lead teacher in that district. We have a director of clinical partnerships over the three years. So after the junior year of, of clinical experiences, they have a senior year student teaching that lasts the year. Then they come back for a fifth year and do an internship in those professional development schools on a school-based problem that they need help with so that they can exhibit the qualities of teacher leadership that we want our teachers to be. We're trying to build change agents. Well, the value back to the districts for their partnerships of give and take is that they have these wonderful, really, first-year teachers in their schools for 18 hours a week that they're working on everything from working programs for homeless kids to setting up computer labs to doing whatever it is the collective group at that school with the students think they need. So those clinical experiences in, in sites have led, led to a whole new way of looking at the teaching learning process. And this is what I've said for years. And when you talk to our teachers and our partners in our schools, it is not UConn's problem, program. It is our program. I think that's critical for every prep program, whether it's a residency or if it's a university place program. Um, across the program and in all of our seminars, there's not only courses in teacher leadership, but there's an emphasis on critical thinking, collaboration, working together. The courses model what we're trying to get our teachers to do to, to implement deeper learning. So here's the rub what I see for, for teacher education. And I think I'm not, we're not alone at UConn that do it. There's just a few examples of how we do there and what we believe in there are many places across the country. This is what bothers me most, though. I was just talking with two kids that are I'm very close to my students, and particularly uh, those in, in the high school. And I just asked them about their starting situations, because I've known these students since they were freshmen. And they both got their new jobs, and they're starting in a couple of weeks. <laughs> And they're both excited to engage in deeper learning. They're both engaged and they want to work in high need areas. One student didn't get her first wish. She ended up in a very wealthy suburban neighborhood. And the other student got his wish. And he is in a school district with 100% kids are on free and reduced lunch. Uh, the majority of kids are ESL. On one hand, a kid has one of my, I shouldn't say kid. <laughs> My, my young teacher has a class ratio of 24 to 1. On the other, it's 35, 36. On one hand, one of my teachers is going into classrooms where all students bring their computers in that are platform ready and go home. In the other class, we have to roll out the lab every day because students don't have connectivity. They don't, they don't have the same access to, to the opportunities. If we're really going to do deeper learning and we're setting up these teachers and preparing them, we can't then put them in schools that are not going to help them become the teachers that we've worked so hard to do. And you can mentor all you want. It's like having 1 to 45 ratio for a mentor. If you have 200 students in a high school and more than half of those kids are English language learners, how are you going to do deeper learning from 8 to 2 and still get in a 20-minute lunch? 
I mean, we, we have to somehow take a look at this country to say, what are our schools? So it's, it's, it's both ends uh, of the continuum. So um, the, the other thing is that I, I just want to say before I close, and that's why I feel so strongly about NECTAV, is that if you look today at the number of kids that want to become teachers, our numbers are way down. And I think it's time that we stop pointing at teachers as the problem and saying how wonderful they are and what a great profession it is, because that will allow me then to recruit that wonderful, diverse, high achieving group that want to enter this great profession. And then let's give them the schools that they need to do so they can show their intellectual curiosity and enjoy their life as a teacher and grow from it like our teachers. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate that. We're now going to hear from Kaya Henderson a little bit about how the district can support teachers and the kind of conditions that they can provide, whether it's anything that our teachers identified earlier, it's a response to induction or teacher preparation. Kaya gets to go wherever she wants. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I'm really happy to be here. I think that um, being the leader of a district is an incredibly unique perspective. We are the district or any school organization, be it a charter organization or private school, whatever, we are where the rubber meets the road. If teacher induction does a great job, great. If they don't, that's my problem, right? If prep does a great job, great. If they don't, that's my problem. And my problem is, you know, made evident by parents demanding certain things for their young people. And so I get to solve it all, right? Um, I, I think um, one of the things, the journey that we've been on at DC Public Schools has been a very iterative one. Um, we knew originally that the biggest in-school factor to moving student achievement is what? The quality of the teacher. So let's go get some great teachers and let's make sure we keep the great teachers that we had. And so the initial work that we did at DC Public Schools was figuring out how to make it a great place for teachers to want to be. And our teacher said to us, tell us how you want us to teach because, you know, the standardized test results say this and the interim assessments, which are not aligned to the standardized tests, say that. And we don't have a curriculum, so we're not following things. And, like, we just don't know what good teaching looks like. We want to be effective every day, but we don't know how. And we're working at Macy's at night as a second job because we don't get paid enough and right and so we were like oh gosh like <laughs> we can't get and keep great people unless we change the human capital conditions and so at the beginning we moved to raise teacher salaries so we now have the highest first year teacher salary in the year and a pay in, in the country sorry and a pay for performance system where our teachers can earn up to $120,000 within the first eight years they don't have to work a second job at night they can concentrate on teaching and learning. Our teachers, we actually had to figure out, okay, like what are you good at and what do you need help with? And so we developed a teacher evaluation system that was based on good instructional practices. It wasn't anything super exciting. It was these are what good instructional practices looks, look like. And we're going to actually measure you against them so that we can tell you where you are and design professional development that will help you not in a one-size-fits-all manner, but in a way that, you know, you get help for where you are struggling. And I'm really pleased to say that our teacher evaluation system, more than firing teachers or even valuing the top performers, grows teachers, as evidenced by a report from UVA and Stanford, grows teachers. And our teachers said to us, this is great, we know how you want us to teach, Let's talk about what we're teaching because we're making it up, right? We don't have a curriculum. We said, okay, that's a problem, right? We don't want our teachers to spend their time making it up. And so we built a curriculum, not one grade at a time over 10 years. In the course of three years, we rolled out a curriculum for every single grade level, every single subject area aligned to the reading, writing, and math standards. And our teachers said, this is what we want. Why? Because we engaged our teachers in designing the curriculum with us, right? I can't decide what is going to be effective for our teachers. Our teachers have to tell us what that curriculum look like, look, should look like. And so who did we call? Our very best teachers, as identified by that evaluation tool that we put in place. You'll start to see that these things all work together. 
Each piece is necessary but not sufficient. We identified our highest performing teachers and engaged them with us in developing curriculum. And they said, this is good, but we want to go deeper because we don't see equity of rigor across the district. Some teachers are teaching really deep and hard, and th their kids come prepared, and so they're able to go further. Other teachers are not. But for us, all means all. We serve in a district where we have 50,000 young people who come from all kinds of backgrounds, and it's not good enough for us to educate some kids in some schools at a high level. The challenge of public education is providing a quality education at scale for all kids, right? We're all hyped about charters. I love charters too, but guess what? Everybody can have a school or five schools or 10 schools that are great. The challenge is how do you have 50,000 schools that all provide that level of quality and serve all kids? That is what a district is charged with doing. And so in order to create quality at scale, we have to systematize the things that we do. So we are able to take our curriculum work and move deeper and develop anchor assignments. Again, that our teachers helped us developed that were not just focused on academic rigor, but also focused on joy. Why? Because our kids, my two children, my two children are DC Public Schools children. Like y'all, I want to be confident to send my kids to school and know that they're not just going to be able to read and do math, but they're also going to have a well-rounded education in art, music, PE, foreign language, library. They'll go on international trips. They'll be digital natives. That's the system that we're building. And in order to do that, you have to do that through systems. We have this panel of teachers was wonderful because they're all great teachers. If I had a school district where every single one of my teachers was absolutely amazing, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But I have to build systems where whether I get the best teacher, like the ones on the panel, or ones that come in struggling, we are able to help them be effective. And so the next piece of work that we're doing is deep work around professional development. Uh, we are instituting a program called LEAP, um, Learning Together Advances Our Practice. Uh, where we're not just saying it's too hard to do professional development. We can't do it more than once a month. The time constraints mess us up. We decided we're going to make the investment and figure out how to do it. And so with LEAP, our teachers will be engaged in small professional learning communities led by a content expert weekly, weekly. They will plan lessons together. They will learn the content together because in this ever demanding time, we're asking teachers to teach more and more and do more and more. And so we have to make sure that they have the strong content foundation that they need. So we're spending time on content. They will get regular observations weekly because even with our evaluation system where they are observed three to five times a year, our teacher said, I need more feedback than that. I need regular feedback. And so they will get regular feedback weekly. And they'll look at student work together so that as a collaborative, they can advance the learning of their students. And we're systematizing this. We have changed our school year. We've changed our school day to allow more time to be able to do this. I think that's the work of districts. Districts work is to figure out how you break down these barriers and put the conditions in place for what all you researchers say is the best way to improve teaching. We know, we know it has to be content-based development. We know it has to be in a collaborative setting. We know there have to be experts that teachers can rely on and feel supported by. We know that evaluation is a key part of it, but in fact, so is support. And so how you build systems and structures to do that, to me, is the work of a district or any sort of organizing body. Um, it made me very happy to uh, hear the teacher who teaches in DC public schools talk about um, the professional development systems, the teacher leadership positions. I always have to check myself because, you know, when you're the head of a district, your staff members say, we're doing X, Y, and Z, right? But when your teachers say, yes, we're doing X, Y, and Z. <laughs> Moreover, when your kids come home and bring the homework that looks like what your staff is saying, then you, you know, you're legit. And so I feel like we have, we've been able to see at DCPS this evolution. But I think that, you know, in the policy debate and the conversations about what's right and what's wrong with education, we have forgotten that schools and school districts are in the people development right. business. 
We take little people and we prepare them to be effective big people. But as important as taking our big people and making them more effective. And if we don't get to be expert, my goal for my organization is to be the best teacher and people development organization in town. We stopped outsourcing principal development to other people because if we don't build our own leaders and train them the way we want them to lead, then somebody else's values and somebody else's agenda are leading our schools. If we outsource teacher training to other people, then somebody else's priorities are leading our classrooms. It's hard, it costs money, it's slower than whatever new silver bullet initiative you think of, but that's the work of school districts. And we've worked really hard to strip away some of the things that other people do well. We don't build buildings well. Guess what? Nobody on my team knows how to build a building. And we shouldn't have to. There are people who know how to do that. Nobody on my team knows the healthiest school lunch. And we shouldn't have to. There are people who know that. We have to be experts in teaching and learning. And that means resisting all of the other things that come our way and taking the time and realigning our resources, both money, time, people, to being the best people preparation organizations around. Thank you, Kaya, for your leadership here in DCPS, but nationally and um, and just yeah, I mean your leadership and your voice is, is uh, so amazing, and we'll miss you very much. Thanks. So thank you for joining us today, and can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Yeah. Uh, exactly. yeah. So Michelle, um, kind of bring us back home and maybe talk a little bit about where the intersection of, of the system and the school meets to support our teachers. Oh, uh, good morning. Uh, this has been so inspiring that I keep changing <laughs> what I'm talking about yeah. right? to, to try to say anything valuable. Um, so um, after Gen Genevieve and the, the teachers and Kaya and, and everyone on this, this panel, I have, a, I think, a few points to illustrate a really kind of boring sentence in the report, which is, be supported by a system of aligned resources organized for success, mm -hmm. right? And that's the kind of sentence that just trips off my lips, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody says, what's she talking about, right? Right. And, and I was going back when uh, jean was was talking to my first teaching experience, which was I taught uh, kids who dropped out of high school already. Uh, and I was uh, incredibly moved and surprised as I was doing it by their talents, right? And how it was not coming alive until the times, you can tell I'm very old, this was 1970, right? The times were that we wanted them to create a bilingual youth newspaper to work on change in their community. Right? And all of a sudden, people were learning to write and taking edits and working on their literacy and everything because they had a purpose. Right? So jumping from that to this notion of systems, um, my hardest job ever was uh, being in charge of secondary education reform in New York City and um, creating a design competition to create 200 new small schools, that would be far more effective uh, for the young people in, in the city. So taking that, you go from the absolute teacher-individual relationship to systems level when we had about 80,000 students who were in what had come to be called dropout factories, right? So how do you take a sentence like be, t re, supporting teachers with a system of aligned resources organized for success. I think a first, a first step is, of course, respect for the people who, for the young people and for the people who are going to be doing the teaching, and voice, right? That we can't do this without empowering voice and listening if you're at a system level. I think a second step, and people spoke to it in uh, many times today, was agreeing on a mission and purpose. What are we doing? What, what, what will 
mean success, right? And how would that be strong enough that we know when we've got it, uh, concrete enough that we know when we've got it, but not narrow and not mechanistic, right? So I think the kinds of challenge that we have in organizing for success around purpose is the notion that we need to not talk about academic rigor and 21st century skills as separate. Like, it's not problem solving that or uh, critical thinking in which you take a class in critical thinking, right? What we heard illustrated here today is that young people need to be masters of fundamental literacies, you know, building the academic core necessary for college, com critical readers, compelling writers. They also need to have foundational knowledge, right? We need them, and this is where it gets built into the 21st century skills, they need to be curious people who are knowledgeable about the world, science, um, uh, history and culture, their own heritage and the diversity of our country, um, engaged participants, original thinkers for an uncertain world. And this is certainly different from when I was teaching. The world is changing so rapidly, and they are going to. So I think as our teachers were talking about the, what they were doing and engaging with their students, it's really make, being sense makers, right? Kids have to understand and be able to. I was really um, thinking about that when, um, Joanna, you were talking about evidence and like how we have to. So everything you're talking about, what teachers have to do, we have to support. So they need to do it with teachers collaborators on tough problems, uh, and also uh, learning for life, right? So if that's the purpose, how do you build systems around that, right? You have to build a system of good schools where it's happening there. So what can you do at the system level? Well, we just had the inspiration of Kaya talking about what she's actually done. Let me give a couple of other um, uh, framing of I think we need to think about design and design characteristics of effective schools and make them part of the vocabulary. So everyone who's spoken, and I'm going back to Jal's uh, talk as well, talks about the centrality of positive youth development supports. That is, this is a people business, as you were saying, a people support business, which starts with the very needs and opportunities that young people are driven, they have, and they are driven to fulfill. And we can either do that in a positive way or we can crush them, right? And the core to that is relationships, right? Caring relationships with adults who know them well. But we structure school often, and most of my experience is at the, virtually all my experience, it is all at the secondary level, right? We make it really hard for teachers to know students often at the secondary level by the way we use time, by the way we, we organize uh, departments, right? We, way, way we uh, enable um, class size, any number of things in which it's just very hard to have 120 students on your roster in 40 minute periods and actually come to know them, right? It's very hard when, stu when um, don't know who the other teachers are that these students have in a big school, in a, in a complex, comprehensive high school. When they may have, the students in your class may have three or four guidance counselors. Teachers have talked to me about when that was broken and they got to be a team, when the district enabled this kind of transition change where they could have teams who had the same group of students with a team of teachers, that they actually could have conversations about a student at the most um, sophisticated level of learning and what's working and not working. And the most basic level, is this, uh, is this student cutting my class or are they absent all the time, right? It's like, like is this a behavior issue? Is this, a, is this a, another kind of issue? And also, someone can help us solve that besides my finding him uh, before or after class and, you know, tell him to show up, right? Which is all I have time to do because that will just take one minute away from, uh, from what I'm doing. So we have seen lots of these kinds of changes. What do I mean by design characteristics? It means mission and culture, 
is clear and everyone affiliates with it. And it's also high standards and toward the purpose of, of the school. So creating caring and, and trusting relationships between adults and, and students, between students and students, so that there's peer support for high expectations and learning. And, and uh, recruiting, being able to, uh, I'm going to get that to that in a second. But these kind of core, having a core instructional, rich and rigorous instructional program and that enables mo different modalities of learning, right? I could go on with three or four more, but the most important thing about it is if you have that frame in mind for what has to happen at the level, a system level, it's how do you actually create the conditions where at the school level people can affiliate with the mission <laughs> and, and purpose because it's, it's well known, but where they have, where there is flexibility around uses of money time and technology so that school leaders and teachers can actually address problems that they uncover, but also can um, create some new innovation to address those. So that is very difficult to do, but it is absolutely essential. The reason I call it design thinking as central to, I think, our educational work here, is that we have to think that every way in which we touch a school has an impact on the overall teaching and learning. So teacher, we talk about, it's so easy for us, um, and especially, you know, I was also in philanthropy, right? We can say we're going to fund new teacher roles or, or something like that, and all of a sudden it stands out there. And it's not bad. It is, we do need new, new roles for teachers. But we need new roles for teachers that are in service of teachers being able to create new, these new roles, but also um, act in them effectively for the purpose of school. So I think, um, and you know, in shorthand, um, just to finish with a couple of examples, because I haven't probably given enough, when I went back to that question of, of how, would, how or why we would try to create new schools. And we also did a whole range of things with the other schools. There were so many, so there were a lot of possibilities for doing different kind of options. But the design competition had multiple levels to it. And I speak to it because it was really about teachers. One thing I had a lot of experience with, because I had done 80 school-based community centers around New York City, was the difference in the, quali the quality and, and strength capacity of teaching versus in outer Brooklyn, the South Bronx, and who you could get. South Bronx, you would clearly go to a school. They didn't, Jennifer, Genevieve's school did not exist, in which routinely all the English teachers in the middle school would be first year teachers, right? You're going through teachers every two years, right? The deeper learning schools were concentrated in a few places. You know, we couldn't get people there. So he said, what if we make it possible for those really strong teachers to start a school, but they have to do it in the Bronx, or they have to do it in Brownsville, and they have to do it in partnership with a community-based organization that's strong in cultural competence, and, you know, vertical integration, a whole range of other things. Those are deliberate system actions that you do have control over. You know, it's not that you want to say, okay, we're transferring you there. It's like we're giving you an opportunity to grow. And it'll be competitive, you know, we're not gonna like at least start a school that has no rigor or something, but but this is a real opportunity and to create lots more school principals, school leaders who and then we changed with the AFT the UFT in New York, we changed how you could hire, that you could hire at the school level, technology for that. So altogether, the whole notion is systems change has to start with the purpose of school, the design characteristics, and what you need to do to support it. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, yeah, and thanks to the entire panel. I think we can all recognize we're very much at a crossroads in our nation when it comes to, to teaching and to learning. And we have so much work to do. We've done so much since the first report, what matters most. And I think the other exciting part, we really are at a place where there's consensus about the fact we needed to develop 
extra, you know, expanded learning outcomes, whether you want to call them deeper learning, 21st century skills, anything you want to call them. But we're at a place where we recognize this. But Kaya really, you know, kind of hit the nail on the head, as did Michelle, is we still need to systematize how we develop and support our teachers. We still have not systematized this. And this is where we, as Nick Taff, as commissioners, hope that this report can be helpful to the field and to policymakers. So we will finally be able to systematize support for teachers, not just in DCPS, not just in some districts, in some places in New York, but across our nation. So thank you very much for, for, for the, to the panelists and for you all being here today. Can you hear me? <laughs> I also want to thank that wonderful panel. Um, you know, it makes your head swim a little to think of what the challenge is ahead of us. But I go back to, again, that this commission is optimistic that these changes can be made and that we have a moment where there's a lot of agreement on what we want teaching and learning to look like. And now, as a collective, we can come together and, and really push for it to happen and happen the way we want it for our kids and their kids. Um, today, tomorrow, and going forward. I'm so pleased to introduce our next and closing speaker. Um, I would say she needs no introduction, <laughs> Linda Darling Hammond. You all may know this, but Linda founded NICTAF 22 years ago and really launched us all on this journey in support of better preparation, induction, and supports for teachers to ensure that all students have the opportunity to learn and grow. Linda has been an engaged and supportive commissioner and a collaborative participant in our discussions and our work. And we're so pleased to have her give us the call to action um, as we leave today. Thanks, Linda. It's hard to follow such an amazing collection of thought leaders and speakers. Um, I was thinking as Geneviève was singing and talking to us about how uh, I came into teaching because of my sense of its importance in changing the world. Uh, when Stephanie mentioned how engaging and interesting it is every single day, where did you go, Stephanie? There she is. <laughs> I resonated with that. Uh, and Michelle, when you talked about how authentic and uh, serious work for kids that is really engaging them in deeper learning is the way to be effective. Uh, I recalled the same kids that I taught as a first year teacher who uh, had, you know, all failed school the year before and how engaging and brilliant they were um, when given the right kind of opportunities. This agenda is critically important now more than ever. Uh, not only individual success, but societal uh, success depends on achieving educational goals, societies cannot succeed uh, in the 21st century if we don't do education well for every single child, not just some who are creamed off at the top for you know honors courses or advanced placement or something, but every single child reaching the kinds of goals that we used to restrict to a very, very few. 20 years ago when NICTEF uh, issued What Matters Most, it was the first time that the critical role of teachers had been raised to public attention. The, often used phrase that teachers are the most important in-school variable affecting student learning began then. Uh, people were like, oh, wow, teachers. <laughs> what about that? Um, at that time, the bipartisan commission was chaired by Democratic Governor Jim Hunt from North Carolina, Republican Governor Jim Edgar from Illinois. I uh, came to five recommendations that are echoed in this report and taken further. Uh, at that time, we said, let's get standards right for students and teachers. Let's reinvent preparation and professional development. Uh, let's fix teacher recruitment, uh, encourage and reward teacher knowledge and skill, and organize schools for student and teacher success. And some states have made progress in all of these areas. And some cities have made progress in all of these areas, uh, many of them initially working with NICTAF in a partnership. Um, we now do have uh, not only the national board standards, but they are taken up 
uh, and are used for reciprocity across the states and are the basis for additional salaries in um, many states and districts. In task, which came from the national board, was a 40 plus state effort to take standards for teachers linked to student standards forward and more than 40 states adopted those standards. Um, some states demonstrated what it is to fix teacher recruitment. North Carolina and Connecticut both raised their salaries and equalized them so that there was a capacity for districts to compete in the labor market for teachers, added money for national board certified teachers, added mentoring for all new teachers. Both of them closed their achievement gaps. Uh, Connecticut became the highest achieving state in the nation in that time because of a set of teacher reforms. North Carolina was the first southern state to break the glass ceiling of achieving above the national average, had the biggest closure of achievement gaps during that period of time. Um, now, politics are different, uh, but that foundation was, was really based on those sets of reforms. Many universities have reinvented teacher education, as uh, Rich said earlier, and have that full year of uh, student teaching that this report calls for and relevant clinical practice. Uh, professional learning was reinvented. More than 40 states adopted teacher mentoring and induction during that subsequent uh, decade. Uh, some schools redesigned in New York City was the hotbed of efforts to rethink school designs. But we have fallen back in all of these areas. So we are not building on all of those advances as much as we could be. So uh, higher standards are often ignored for teachers when hiring for high need schools. And we've heard about the leaky bucket and the revolving door that continue to be the reality for way too many of our children. Salaries have in fact fallen for teachers. Uh, the Center for American Progress did a recent report which showed that in 30 states, more than 30 states, the children of experienced teachers in a family of four qualify for free and reduced price lunch and a variety of other government programs. Fewer teachers had mentoring in 2012 than had it in 2008 because of cutbacks from the recession. Now only 59% of teachers say that they're getting a mentor. Used to be over 75%. Uh, more professional learning over the decade of the thousands uh, became spray and pray and one-shot workshops. There was the case previously, uh, and more teachers got that you know one-shot kind of uh, deal that we know doesn't advance practice. Fewer received extended, sustained professional learning than did a decade ago. The proportion of teachers saying that they worked in collaborative settings dropped in half from about 30%, not that high, to 15%. So we have a lot of rebuilding to do. Uh, in the international surveys of teachers, U.S. teachers were found to teach more instructional hours than those in any other country. 27 hours a week, the international average is 19. Think about what you would do, all the teachers who are here with that eight extra hours a week. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> and how that would enable collaboration, professional planning, and the kind of redesign that we're talking about here. And we know that that kind of collaborative time uh, also leads teachers to be more engaged in deeper learning practices. There's evidence on that, well, uh, on that as well. So school design may still yet be our biggest problem. And I really think that you know, re-engaging uh, that issue is every bit as important as helping us get good teachers on the front end. We've got to keep people in a setting that allows them to do the work. Uh, I just finished an international study of, uh, in a number of countries around the world that have teaching and learning systems in which all teachers are well paid, uh, competitively paid, and uh, equitably paid. All of them receive strong mentoring. All of them are well prepared in settings where they get that full year of clinical practice in a partner school attached to the university. All of them are well supported and have anything from 10 to 20 hours a week that they spend in collaborative planning uh, and research and reflection and so on. Every single thing we saw 
uh, began from an innovation or is replicated in an innovation in the United States, but no state in this country has all of those things done systemically to create the future that we're describing here. Uh, Michelle used the term deliberate system action, and I think that's the takeaway in the call to action that we need to think about. We're really good in the United States at innovating, at inventing things, at creating things. Many people here have created wonderful, successful programs and models and schools, and then watched them either fade away when you know the political wheel turned or um, fail to get scaled up. We've got to get good at scaling and systems. And that's really the takeaway. The most important commission recommendation, although they're all important, that I want to call your attention to is number two. Uh, every state should establish a commission on teaching, learning, and the state's future, which includes the state agencies and boards, the governor, education organizations, superintendents, principals, teachers, business leaders, to think about how systemically in that state to implement for all teachers, not just a lucky few, not just a few who get a foundation grant here or a little pilot project there, a system in which we can do the things that are in all the other NICTAF recommendations. Uh, this is a moment where that's possible. ESSA allows us to turn the page to look at new ways of approaching state planning. Every state will have to develop a plan for how it's going to have an effective teaching force. Every state will be thinking about what does deeper learning, higher order thinking skills look like in our state? How are we going to build a curriculum and assessment system? If we can facilitate, as Nick Taff intends to do um, in the coming years, the capacity of states to think at, like other high performing nations to build uh, teaching and learning systems then I hope we'll be able to say when we next come together, not too long for now, that those who can do and those who understand teach and those who can teach and those who can't go into a less significant line of work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Secretary Riley, did you want to? Well, I've enjoyed the morning. It's been a great morning, and I thank all of you. Uh, what great, uh, Linda is my teacher. Uh, all of you all are my teachers. And, uh, and this program, every one of these speakers are my teacher. All of you out there that have worked for the good of education are my teachers, and I thank you for that. Uh, when I was a secretary, uh, I, my wife and I had 14 grandchildren. And one was born about every year I was secretary. <laughs> so I would make a, a real habit of presenting my recently born grandchild, a picture usually, and, uh, and talk about them and their future and their life and how important education was to them. And I, my children uh, in Sacramento had a child born after most of the others had gotten grown. And Stella, she is something. And uh, they live in Sacramento. Stella is now going to first grade in public school in Sacramento. And uh, she lost her first tooth uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, she's amazing. She can write, whatever. Well, anyhow, she's in kindergarten. So she, the family, of course, took the tooth from under her pillow and put a dollar bill in there from the tooth fairy. So Stella got up the next morning and got the dollar and wrote a note to the tooth fairy. And she said, dear tooth fairy, uh, I thank you very much for the dollar, but I was hoping to get two. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've got to help her learn about gratefulness. <laughs> I just want you all to know how grateful I am for all of you and what you've said here today and, meant, and, and maybe we'll really turn something loose. This is a time of change, a very important part of all the different states in the new federal law. Uh, it's a time for action to do something. Uh, let's take this report, and I'm so proud of it. Uh, go with it. Uh, let's use it. Move it around in your various 
uh, organizations or around the various states, uh, and let's see if we can't move things forward in this exciting time of change. It is an exciting time. It's not a time to, to fear. It's a time to get busy and deal with the change that's taking place. Thank you all very much. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, we appreciate it. We appreciate the many partnerships that are represented in this room, and we look forward to many more. Thank you. Thank you.